Welcome back to Transform Your Workplace. I'm Brandon Laws, and we've got a bonus episode today. We've got Annie Oxenfeld and Lacey Partipillo back on the show. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you. We're going to talk about performers, top performers, low performers. We found a clip. Lacey, I don't know if you found this or Annie found it, but I'm going to play this clip for listeners and, and for you guys, and then we're going to we're going to dive in. So let's play it. If you sit next to an a high performer. Yeah. So if you have your team sit next to a high performer, you do, you will outperform by 15%. So a high performer just in your proximity will increase your performance by 15%. If you sit next to a low performer or underperformer, it will decrease your productivity by 30%. So every B player you bring on board is not just decreasing their productivity by 30%. It is that energy transfer, which is that everybody around them becomes a little bit less productive. Isn't that crazy? Like I've heard this related to even like income earning too. So your average income would probably be like the 10 people that you're around the most. Like I've just heard of things like that. And what do you think about the performance comment? That was really interesting. I think we've seen it more often we notice it i think on the negative side of things we hear that a lot with our clients and how that ripple effect happens when you have a low performer or someone who is exhibiting toxic behavior in the workplace but the positive side i thought was really interesting and just made me think a lot uh, about that lacy and i were chatting about it a little bit but i think it's encouraging i think it's something you could leverage as a tool mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we hear about uh, the turnover that people are experiencing right now and the impact of hanging on to poor performers can be huge. Great employees don't want to work with B players, mm. C players, even worse than that. And I know I have personally experienced it. it. It matters who you sit by. It has an impact, not just on just the vibe and the camaraderie, but like when you're sitting by somebody who's productive and working hard and producing quality work, it really does make you want to keep up with that and, and do as well. And, and on the flip side too, it's really demotivating to mm -hmm. be on a team with people that are not pulling your weight. So saying like, you're only as strong as your weakest link. I think this applies in this case, right? Like I think if you had poor performers around a bunch of high performers, I bet you'd see a regression with the top performers regressing back to mm -hmm. the low performers in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if there's not a culture of accountability, if it's show up as your best and if your best is a C, then cool. If it's an A, that's cool too. I think that's when your A players start to think, why am I working so hard? Why am I putting everything into this when it doesn't matter? It's not being recognized or treated differently than folks who are putting less into the job or have less output. What comes up for me in, in the, just hearing that clip is like proximity. So if we're sitting around people who are top performers, like I'm likely to raise my game, but with remote work, how do we, how does the proximity effect take hold in this? I think that's so interesting. And I, and I know for myself, when we all went remote and obviously we're still, we're remote right now and, and doing this hybrid thing, I was drawn to to reaching out to people that in some cases I didn't even work with on a regular basis and set up regular meetings with those people to stay connected. And so I think in a remote environment, you have to be really like on purpose about it. And that could be creating organized chat systems where you've got a few people on a group chat and there's that camaraderie that's happening and they're motivating and talking about the work that they're doing and getting really excited about sharing that information or those really deliberate one-on-one -on -one check ins that where you can just stay connected. And I feel like for me, that was the game changer and what made a difference for me. And I know that the people that I was connecting with, I was trying to stay connected with as many people as possible, but the relationships that I built with people that I know are working really hard and, and performing well made an impact for me in, in helping me stay at a high level of performance too. I think if you're having team meetings, if you're in a leadership role, being able to under, underscore the success stories, that top performance in a group mm -hmm. setting can replace some of that proximity, right? If we're being intentional about, you know, 
highlighting that and demonstrating it and showing others what's possible. It could be a motivating factor for, oh, I didn't even think of that, or wow, they're really killing it. Maybe I'm going to reach out to them and see if they can give me some tips or tricks. And so just making sure that there's a little bit more visibility to that high performance, I think is, like you said, needs to be intentional in a remote environment. On the flip side, I think you get less, potentially less of that negative impact of proximity if you have a low performer that might be seated beside four four different people in the office if they're working remotely like everyone else. There could be less of a mm-hmm. transfer there in the remote environment. I feel like the, the low performers would like shift into the shadows in a, in a remote environment, become mm. quiet, not be engaging, and that can be that can be troubling. And it's really hard to manage people in a remote environment in terms of low productivity and quality of work. It's hard to do that. So I think for managers that are managing people remotely, those one-on-ones are really important. Checking in, having visibility to the work so that you can stay on top of dealing with a situation where someone's not performing. If it's true that the people will perform at the level of those around them based on the proximity effect that we're talking about, Does that mean we need to spend more time with the low performers then? We want to elevate them so everybody around them could be better because you don't want them to drag the top performers down as we we talked about. So do we spend more time with the low performers and build? I have strong feelings about this. (laughs) I'm curious what you're going to say. I think managers spend way more time with their low performers than they should be. And I think it's draining. Mm -hmm. It's exhausting. It is the worst job to manage somebody who's not doing a good job. It's, it is the worst. It's the moment where a manager wants to tap out. And I think what happens is high performers are probably just naturally interested in doing well, and they don't need the nudges that the low performer needs, but it can be super demotivating and frankly, really frustrating. And I think is a reason why a top performer might leave is if they feel like they're getting all the attention. And you see this in schools too, teachers having to spend all their time with the kids that are messing around and not paying attention in class. And people who have a ton of potential don't get pushed hard enough and they get bored. And we end up having kids who could have been really top students falling in the middle because they weren't getting pushed and and they weren't experiencing that attention from the teachers. I just really think that managers should be spending um, a lot of time. And I don't know if what the, I don't know what the right balance is more with the good than the bad, but um, more time than they are. Um, probably in most cases. Um, I think it would be motivating for the manager to do that. I don't know, mm-hmm. if you, Annie, what you would yeah, say to Annie, that. No, I agree with everything in. you said. I think, <laughs> yeah, I agree with all of it. I think the, the low performers, it tends to be reactionary, right? So it's that's why it's hard to shift to, oh, what does my top performer need? And because that's more proactive, that's more long-term, that's future-focused. And so many managers are really have a hard time getting out of the right now and what's needed in this moment. And that often is the low per- attention to low performers. And I think there's what I see a lot with managers is a tolerance for a certain level of low performance where it's, it's not egregious, it's not horrible, but gosh, if this person just did X, Y, Z, they would be, they would be doing great. And we tolerate that for a long period of time because it's not enough to say, oh, this is awful. They've got to go. So all of this energy gets poured into this person and really without asking the questions that you need to ask, which are, does this person even want to be performing at a higher level and do they have what it takes? So for those folks where they have both of those things, ideally we're not just spinning our wheels and continuing to have the same conversations and having to over address issues, right? Are they in the right seat? That's another good question to ask. But a lot of times those two things aren't there and or one of them is missing, but we're still pouring all this time and energy and we're never going to get them up to where we want them to be or what we think their potential could be. Those are the tough ones because it's like, then you have a really hard decision to make of, is there another position that would be better suited for them in the organization? Or do we need to talk about an, an exit strategy for them um, when it's we're just looking at mediocre performance versus like really bad um, performance. And to Lacey's point, if you're continuing to tolerate that, if you're continuing to put those resources in there, your, your top performers are probably plateauing a little bit because they're not getting developed and they're not getting challenged and pushed. And that's what motivates a lot of people who are natural top performers. 
How do we make performance an objective measure versus subjective? Because I'm sure there's many managers out there that are just like, I like them, they fit well, and they equate that to performance, but that's not an objective measure by performance at all. Is there assessments you recommend? Are there key performance indicators? Like what, how do you go about measuring the performance? Like whether it's just establishing a baseline and then measuring like progress in the future against some other measure. But what do you recommend there? I know you coached a lot of employers on this. Yeah, I think it's a few things. One, you've got to have a really good job description. So we need to be clear on what is the job and what are those the essential functions and what's the purpose of the role. The second part is what are the competencies that are required for this? What do we want this person demonstrating consistently, and that should be across anyone who's in that role. Um, so you need to be able to identify that. Um, and those tend to be measurable, even though they might be softer skills, you should be able to have some pretty good observations and data points for that. And then there can be, like you said, KPIs that are more, more measurable, even like a, a sales target or some kind of figure that someone's tracking towards where it's very easy, either they hit it or they didn't. And maybe you even have a range of this is what we see as what's acceptable. Anything below this is problematic. Anything above this is wow, knocking it out of the park. It depends on the industry and the job, obviously, whether or not sales is easy for, because we, that's dollar amount, but there could be other things, client satisfaction or uh, different ways of measuring um, someone's impact to the business. Lazy, any other thoughts on that or agree with Annie? <laughs> I just, I think there's natural bias that comes in with managers. So I think even yeah. if you have all of that, I think having some way to calibrate assessments is important, whether that's if you're doing annual reviews and you have an opportunity to have managers come together, particularly for similar roles um, and calibrate to make sure that we're using the right the right measures, especially for those things that are softer skills like communication, or are they embodying the company's core values? That type of stuff can be hard to put a number to. Some type of training and, and calibration for supervisors, I think, is pretty key in this if you are implementing some type of performance management system. And we're seeing folks move a little bit away from those really large traditional annual reviews and focusing more on less formal but more frequent performance feedback loops. And whether that's quarterly or monthly or some other cadence, I think that can be really effective versus waiting till the end of the year to pull out the job description and dust off the review form and go through and talk through what is it that has been going well and, and hasn't been going well. Yeah. So you both advocated for rewarding and spending more time with top performers. I think that's natural. I think it's the, I think it's the right call. But are there risks involved in spending too much time and rewarding them for their performance and while demoralizing the average performers to low performers? Are, are there any risks associated with that from your perspective? That's a good question. I think in my mind, it's less about rewarding the high performers and it's more about spending time with them. And and maybe for some that might feel like a, a reward, getting to spend time with your manager is meaningful, especially if they're a working manager and they're busy. I know I appreciate that. I think the risk would probably be potentially having disengaged employees or a poor performer whose not, performance is not being addressed. And I don't think that's what Annie and I are suggesting. It's really about ensuring that you are tempering your schedule in a way that allows for you to make time for the people that maybe don't need your guidance every day, but want you to check in with them. They wanna know that you're noticing the work that they're doing, that you're recognizing it as much as you are um, rewarding it. And I don't know that it would be the worst thing if a low, especially a low performing employee left an organization. Sometimes that self-selection is can have a positive impact. Everybody you know, has different strengths. And so there are folks that they may not be your top performer, but there's things that they're doing that are going well. And we want to make sure and, and have a place place for that. But I think at the end of the day, people that are performing well want to work with people that are performing well. And that's what I think that's what that that original reel is talking about. Yeah, I we 
Yeah, definitely don't think we should ever neglect any employees. We need to make sure that we're developing everybody, spending time with everyone, but just also making sure that you are proactive and not accidentally forgetting the top performers because they do tend to be pretty independent. They do tend to not need a lot or not ask for a lot. And so still recognizing that they probably do have needs. They probably do have things that they want to stay engaged and feel connected to the workplace and making sure that you're making time for that. I think with re rewards is an interesting component of that. Like if you're talking about hitting certain targets and maybe there's a bonus or a financial component to that. I think depending on your industry, depending on your employee population, that can be motivating for certain folks. Um, and so it, it comes down to understanding what those key motivators are for each of your employees, because they are going to be different. If you throw a bonus system at a group of employees that really values connection, it might not be effective, but some people might get really motiv motivated by a reward like that. So I think it just it depends. But I also think we probably not going to get to a place where we have only top performers in our organization. <laughs> so it's being realistic too about what's that balance. And Lacey said, leveraging the strengths of those who maybe you don't consider a top performer, but have some really good strengths that we could maybe maximize a little bit more and keep them motivated and, and contributing at a steady level. I think that's really important too. I was laughing because <clears throat> when you were saying like, everybody could be a top performer. It was the, is the Lake Wobegon effect where it's like every, they asked people what their IQ was and it was like, everybody said they're above average IQ. Mm -hmm. and it's like, yeah. Everybody can't be above average. It's just not possible. <laughs> Everyone can't be above it's average. Top. Yeah. I think we talked about like spending a lot of time with the top performers, but isn't there a way, especially with all the technology nowadays that we can actually streamline our development efforts. That's equitable. Everybody has the same access to the tools and maybe you're Lacey, you were more talking about like one-on-ones with your top performers, like spending more one-on-one -on -one time, maybe experiential learning, but there's gotta be a way to scale development. Isn't there? I think there's technology that we can use to support in making sure that our employees have access to L and D. So, so training and curriculum and, and making that accessible online and to all employees. I think when I think about what would help a, a top performer to feel, to continue to be motivated, make finding tools and making the job easier so that they can continue to grow. So having folks within your organization that are looking for tools and technology to make work easier and to make the work product a better product, I think is huge and making sure that's not necessarily happening in pockets and that's accessible to everybody, I think is really important. Some of this is managing people and, and I love AI and, and we want to use the tools and technology, but some of it really is relationship and time. And that doesn't scale. Unfortunately, I, if there was a bot that could have our one-on-ones, I'm, I don't, I just don't know that would be effective. So every individual is unique. Their needs are unique. And so you have to have a little bit of the scale in terms of what folks have access to but the customization comes in the relationship and making sure that we're giving people what they need, where they're at, depending on their development. I always lean into that, probably maybe to a fault more than on the, the tech scale side. I think one way to potentially scale a little bit of it is taking those top performers who are individual contributors and pairing them with folks who need a little bit more development or more junior in their career, almost like a mentorship. You're hitting two things there. One, that junior person gets to learn and grow and get developed by someone who is on the team and is very successful. And then that top performer gets to grow and develop their leadership skills, their, their coaching and mentoring skills, which can be really rewarding and feel like they're having more of an impact than just their individual role, um, which can be really great in a situation if you've got a full leadership team and you don't have a lot of opportunities to, to grow someone into that role, at least not yet, finding those ways for them to contribute in bigger ways and have a bigger impact on the organization takes a little bit of that off of the the, the person's manager, but also develops their skill sets as well. I think that, I think that's a great point. What, one thing that when you were talking about the pairing that made me think about 
having really clear lines about the role of the mentor. And I think it can feel, having been one before, I think it can feel confusing. Am I supposed to be giving this person feedback? Am I, who, how do I engage with the manager on that? And I've experienced before folks that have been in those roles and been really frustrated by maybe a manager not taking action or they don't have, they don't necessarily have all the information about where that employee is at, maybe on the path out of the organization potentially. And so if you're working with somebody that is, I think there's a difference between the the poor performer and somebody who's still developing, like the, the poor performer who's not meeting expectations and creating issues for the organization, that mentor could potentially become frustrated. So I, I feel yeah. like you'd want to have some sort of loop back to a manager to make sure that they're not, they're not getting demotivated by that. Cause I imagine yeah. that would be really frustrating. That could be really frustrating. Yeah. Let's end with this. You guys work with a lot of small and mid-sized organizations. So let's say a leader came to you and say, look, my organization doesn't even have any performance improvement methodology. Like we're building this from the ground up. What steps would you take around an entire organization's development program? Like give me a blueprint. Yeah, that's tough because it's going to be super customized depending on the organization. And just a plug for Zenium, we we can help with that. Um, But generally, I mean, what I always say to clients who've got nothing um, is we want to start somewhere. And usually it's with something a little bit more informal. So Lacey said, not waiting till the once a year annual reviews, but having quarterly check-ins, even if it's just a one pager and really equipping your managers with the tools that they need to have those conversations. Some training would be helpful for that group of people, some tips and tricks for them to navigate those conversations because it could be the first time for them if they're new in a leadership role at this organization and have not done this before. It's really important to make sure that they have what they need to navigate those conversations. And then from there, you can continue to build up and start to get more prescriptive around development plans and tweak things a little bit as you see what works and what doesn't. What would you add, Lacey? I think there's a place to get employees involved too. I think small businesses get really overwhelmed with, oh my gosh, I how am I supposed to do this? The owner is probably also doing some HR. They're probably doing sales. In order to be able to inform whether people are performing or not, you have to start with what Annie said, which was job descriptions. Is there a way to get employees involved in helping put some of that together and articulating what it is that they're doing? And participating in some of that process can help alleviate some of the work on the leadership side of things. I don't know. I feel like sometimes organizations bite off a little more than they can chew in this. And they they start working with a company like Zenium and they're thinking, we just line in the sand. We got to be really rigid. We've got to have policies. We need to start disciplining people. And I think if we swing the pendulum from nothing to that too quickly, we're in a really uncomfortable work environment for many employees. Being really communicative with employees about changes that may be happening, getting their input and involvement, I think is important. And just starting with those baby steps of starting to have some conversations about performance after you've identified what is what are the expectations and what does good performance look like. I don't think you can turn it on overnight and, and turn into an organization where it's all about feedback and how are people doing. It, ta- it can take a little while to get that engine running really smoothly. Yep, said. Annie, Lacey, thanks for coming on the podcast. It's good to have you back. Thanks so much. Thanks fun. for having us again. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are the guest's own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Zenium HR or the host, Brandon Laws. The material and information presented on Transform Your Workplace is for general information and educational purposes only. Zenium HR or the host, Brandon Laws, does not necessarily endorse any guest, their business, or any organization they represent. Discretion is advised. Please work with a trusted advisor to find a custom approach that fits your organization's needs.